Hello Internet, so after a gap of 30 years between Suspiria and the final movie in the Three Mothers trilogy, Argento fans finally get to see the culmination, Mother of Tears, uh, also known as the Third Mother. And was it worth the wait? I held off on seeing this film for so long because of uh, uh, the negative feedback I'd heard about this movie. But before I go into my thoughts about it, just ask yourself this question. Do you expect your 50th birthday party to be exactly the same as your 20th birthday party? You know, it's a funny thing being a Dario Argento fan because we all almost universally seem to agree that Suspiria is his masterpiece or that period. Some say Profondo Rosso. That's fine. There's very little disagreement about the high watermark of Argento's career. And during that high watermark, we all seem to agree that, oh, well, you have to look past the dodgy acting and the plots that make no sense. That's not what Argento's about. Argento brings uh, something else to the table, and that's why we love him. And then the family of Argento fans all seem to agree that the quality of his movies dropped off. And they all seem to agree that he had a bit of a resurgence and a bit of a renaissance. And then they all seem to agree that his qualities dropped off again. But no one can really quite pinpoint where the quality dropped off or what his comeback movie was or where it's sort of dropped off again. Um, it's a little bit like a smorgasbord. Everyone's got their own favourite idea of what Argento is. And most of us agree that Suspiria is a masterpiece and then we start to break off into little factions. Some love the Giallo and Profondo Rosso and some loved him returning to that in Tenebre. So everyone's got their favourite comeback movie, everyone's got their favourite uh, movie where <laughs> they say that Argento's career is now officially over. Some people will go so far as to pinpoint a particular movie and say I'm no longer an, an Argento fan. Uh, and for many people, uh, The Mother of Tears is that movie. It's no Suspiria. It's no Inferno. But three decades have passed. And do you know what it is? It's fun. This is a fun movie. Is it perfect? No. But if you look back at some of the... Look at uh, my uh, Inferno review. Look at my Suspiria re review. Uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, we seem to willfully ignore the flaws in some of the maestro's work and nowadays we, we slam him for them and I don't understand that personally. It's hokey and it's a little out there and tonally sometimes it's, it's a little off, the cackling which is straight out of a Duran Duran video, I find very strange indeed. But there are elements of Inferno and Suspiria that I find very strange. But I, I don't rail against Sargento for that. Uh, there's, there's cause for celebration there. And there's always, always I found something in every Argento movie where he brings some unique flavour to the table that you just wouldn't see anywhere else. Is this his best movie? No, it's a hell of a lot of fun though. And it's a strange ending to the Three Mothers trilogy. And honestly, as a fan of Argento, would I want something safe that kind of made sense? Or I want something slightly bombastic and slightly weird that I can't quite pin down? That seems to me to be the perfect essence of Argento. So in a weird and perverse kind of way, it tickles me that he's angered so many of his fans with this movie because that's the perverse and glorious nature of the man. I had a hell of a lot of fun with this movie. Let me tell you why. Okay, so there's an urn with some statues and a sort of tunic in it and the tunic boosts Mater Lacrimarum's powers and she uses that 
to bring about, to try and bring about the second fall of Rome and the second age of witches. It's a stupid idea, but is it any more stupid than at the end of Inferno, made to Telebrarum going, oh, the building's on fire now, so I guess that's it for me. All of my centuries of planning and influence around the world and all of my magical powers, but someone's knocked over a candle a few floors up, so there's nothing I can do about that, folks. <laughs> it's not more ridiculous. In this movie, at least one of the mothers does something. Maitre Lacrimarum does stuff. She brings her acolytes from all the, all the way around the world. The second fall of Rome, she intends to bring about the second age of wit, uh, witches. And all through Rome, like a sickness, her influence spreads. And violence and crime and murder and rape and robbery are on the increase. And it feels like the beginning of the end of the world. It actually feels like one of the mothers is doing something in this movie. And... Uh, a uh, hero has to work and act against it rather than yet again stumbling across a secret room in a building and accidentally doing something or stabbing someone or doing and then all of a sudden one of the three most powerful witches in all of history is dead i'm really glad to see one of these infernal uh, nemeses actually doing something infernal that's a hell of a lot of fun and boy do does she cause some awful stuff? I mean, the cannibalism of children. We get to that stage. That brings me to the gore, which is, I think, superb in this movie. If you're a gore hound, and the Church of Horror is a broad church, you're not getting the super stylized violence of... Uh, the 70s or early 80s Argento, you're getting fairly ultra, uh, barring some shoddy CGI work. There's an awful lot of practical effects and practical gore here, and because it's a movie of the 21st century, the way it, the, it's filmed and the way it's lit and the way uh, the prosthetics are made, now it's a, it's a lot more closer to photorealistic. You're not going to mistake it for photorealism, but it's unflinching and uncompromisingly presented uber-gore. Now, it's not a complete splatter fest, but it does punctuate the movie right from the start and all the way through at certain opposite points. It leaves you under no illusion that shit is really, really now hitting the fan. And Mata Lacrimarum could potentially uh, cause the downfall of civilization as we know it. She's fucking our shit up. And it's messy. And it's bloody. And just the scene where she kneels down by the mortally wounded white witch and licks the tears off her cheeks, the mother of tears, uh, just tasting her pain is is delicious. Now, admittedly, yes, for the rest of the movie, she wanders around naked in a cave. Uh, shouting at uh, 80s throwback, big, big hair, big, big eye makeup, acolytes. Uh, but she's doing things. About two thirds of the way through the movie, I said to my girlfriend, all I want from this uh, now for it to tip it over the edge into something thoroughly enjoyable is it needs to tie back to the alchemist Valeri, who I called uh, Varelli in my Inferno video. It needs to tie back to uh, Valeri. We need to see his three mothers book and uh, Lacrimarum needs to have a, a base that he built for her and we need to go there for the finale. Tick, tick, tick. I'm a happy chappy. There are references to the other two in this. They're extremely subtle. Uh, Claudio Simonetti of Goblin did the score for this. And while it's, for the most part, uh, the more standard kind of film score that you would expect, there are elements of Goblin's Suspiria score in there, uh, with him uh, hissing and whispering, uh, mother over and over again and the timpani drums come in uh, and there's even a little um, 
call back to the plinky plonky sort of fairy tale Suspiria score when the witches turn up. It's very subtle. It's in there just as flavouring, but it is in there. Just as the lighting, uh, if, if Suspiria is dominated by the colour red and Inferno is dominated by the colour blue, you can't watch Mother of Tears and not notice how, how golden the film is. The, the, color, the predominant colour of Mother of Tears is golden. It's just that rather than with the Technicolor film processing and primary colours and the use of gel lighting, it's faces and backgrounds are just washed uh, with, uh, with this golden light, sort of like painting with watercolours as opposed to acrylics, I guess, if I'm going to pull a half-assed analogy uh, out of thin air. But um, the, the movie is lit absolutely beautifully. And uh, the one thing that you really need to, to pay attention to it is what I, what I think of as the show stopper scene and is reminiscent of the glory days of Argento of old. And it's when uh, Sara, played by Aja Argento, uh, reaches uh, Lacrimarum's house. And by the way, again, tiny, subtle, subtle nods uh, to the previous two movies. When we're moving through that building, which is now run down, uh, in the um, uh, stained glass in the background and some of the frescoes, which are, are now completely dulled, you can see the bizarre art uh, deco uh, sort of expressionist architecture that would have been there, that does link this building in with uh, the hotel in New York and the Dance Academy. Uh, in Germany and in its heyday the building would have looked as of one with the other two that we've seen but it's now just gone to rack and ruin and decay but the little details are there but there's a tracking shot which lasts I think for almost four minutes that takes uh, a steady cam shot not a tracking shot sorry where we follow uh, Sarah into the building uh, up one level down, down into the basement. She speaks to a homeless guy who's living there, back up and out, all in uh, one shot. Quintessential Argento magic. But look how it's lit and the sort of areas of shadow and light she moves through as well. This is choreographed like a ballet, this shot. And the, the, the maestro still, still has it, uh, but it shows in flashes rather than over a sustained 90 minutes, I think. Ultimately, if you want a through line throughout the trilogy, uh, I feel, and maybe I'm just fanboying this, but the way Suspiria opens in the, in the airport, uh, we're trapped in, in the nightmare right from the start, and the entire film takes place in the nightmare so it, it, it it's all primary colors and stark and strange inferno is more globe trotting and, and we're in new york and we're in rome and it's more takes place in our world and then the film slowly gets drawn into the hotel and the gel lighting and the blues uh, of inferno and um mother of tears predominantly takes place in our world as that evil is coming out and infecting out of it. So there really is no place for that kind of harsh gel lighting and the like. It, it is referenced in the movie, but it's, it's very subtle. It's not the greatest movie in the world, but my God, it does not deserve the hate in a program that is, uh, that is descended upon it. Plus, it, the, it's got a demon monkey in it. There's stuff in there that's absolutely fantastic. The opening credits with the, uh, the sort of art history lesson, and then the movie is obsessed with statues and books and antiques and things like that, which the, the background and the mise-en-scene is, is full of. Um, it's a fun movie. <laughs> what more do you want, really? We've, we've had our masterpieces from this guy. Uh, and he's just delivering fun now. Uh, and I was happy with it.